All right, let's go ahead and uh, get to this. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We'll be reading verses 1 through 13. Again, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13, um, that a lot of people call this the chapter of love. So um, let's go ahead and do this. Have it up here. All right, so this is the reading of the word. If I speak in the tongues of men and of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. And kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hope all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Uh, I think the music's still on. You just um, turn, turn it all the way off. Um, so um, as the great theologian Little Wayne once said, um, you had a lot of crooks trying to steal your heart. Never really had luck, could have never figured out how to love. Um, that seems to be like the, 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 the tendency, for, I mean, the, the natural uh, reaction for us. Like we go through life and we are looking for love in all the wrong places. Um, every minute around the world, there are at least four weddings taking place. Every minute around the world, four weddings are taking place. And most of those weddings probably use 1 Corinthians 13 as the thesis of their wedding. You'll see it all over on their tables, um, in the pamphlets. They'll, they'll, they'll post it on Facebook right before um, they get married. And even after they get married, this is a, a caption that is used to go ahead and talk about couples. Love is kind. Love is patient. It is not boast. It is not arrogant. We use these when we often want to remind our significant other, hey, you need to bear with me. I'm flawed. I'm wrong. But love is kind. Love is patient. Um, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Um, that verse is, is so pivotal uh, for Kelly that she made sure when she got my ring, she put it, engraved it on the inside so that I would never forget it. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is obviously a popular, popular passage when we talk about love with one another. However, it might surprise you that 1 Corinthians 13 actually has nothing to do with romantic love. Um, It has everything to do with how Christians are to treat those inside the church and outside the church. Um, This would make sense, right? When the disciples go up to Jesus and they say, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus responds, love God with all your heart, mind and soul. And the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Obviously, if you do the first one, the second one just outflows. It's just it's just natural. And so Jesus says this. Um, In fact, Jesus even goes on in in the book of John and he says, listen, you want to know how the world is going to know that you're truly my disciples? This is how the world's going to know. It's not by how many scriptures you can memorize. It's not by how big your Bible is or, or your perfect attendance in church. That's not how the world is going to know that you're truly my disciples. Here it is. Get close, disciples. He says the way that the world will know is by the love that you have for one another. That's how they're going to know. He even goes on, like the disciples are like, hey, Lord, um, like we're supposed to go ahead and, and forgive one another and, and love one another. Right? He goes, yeah, love your enemies, though. 
the world can go ahead and love anyone who's doing right by them. That's easy. You're giving, you're giving stuff to me. You're helping me out. You're, you're by my side. That's easy. He says, love your, love your enemies. So that doesn't mean just put up with your enemies. That doesn't mean don't hate your enemies. We're talking about love, and love always requires action. That's, that's supernatural there. Do you see why Jesus says, hey, this is the mark of true Christianity. No way you can go ahead and say you are a Christian and you are at odds with your brothers and sisters. It's just impossible. That's not Christianity. This is what Jesus says. But let's be honest. Christians today, unfortunately, are known for what? Being judgmental, harsh, arrogant. So it's a good idea to go ahead and, and have a proper understanding of what love is. A little background information on the text that we just read, 1 Corinthians 13. Paul is writing this letter to a struggling, dysfunctional, young church that's been around for about three or four years. Hey, that sounds like us. Um, and this particular church becomes a huge problem for Paul. But he loves them. And he even says in the book that he has great pride in them. Because it has a lot of potential, but a lot of dysfunction. Grievous sins are taking place in this church that aren't even mentioned amongst the world, Paul says. People are going to the Lord's Supper, communion, and they're getting drunk and eating while other people are starving. Um, but one of the main issues that Paul is having with the church, members are starting to take pride in their gifts that the Lord has given them and their talents. And they're thinking that they're better than each other. And Paul is like, no, 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 no. Stop it. I'm hearing what's going on. You got, and this is, this is why it's here. Chapter 12, he's talking about gifts. Chapter 14, he's going to start talking about tongues of prophecy. And chapter 13, he says, you know what? You're missing the point. You guys are bragging and boasting about the gifts that you have. That's not what it is because we're a body. What was happening, they're like, oh, yeah, we are a body, but I'm an eye. And an eye looks way better than a toe. And it's like, what? Yeah, yeah I'm the hands. And the hands of the, no, 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 listen, hands, you need your feet because without the feet, where, how, how are you going to go anywhere and do something? And he's letting you know, like, every single person in the church needs every other person. And they're bragging and boasting, and it's because they have lost sight of what love is. So Paul begins to write this chapter. The main issue for this church is that they don't understand the virtue of Christian love. And I... I'm going to say that maybe we don't understand it either. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll dive into it. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for this text. Um, we need you. We need you um, as we um, already had uh, presuppositions of, of what this text may say, what this, what this chapter may say about love. And, and we've heard it several times that love is kind, love is patient. Um, but will we really get what you want us to get out of this, oh God? Uh, we need you. We thank you. And in your personal name we pray. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and dive into this. You guys already know verse by verse. So verse one, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Now, he brings up tongues, and, I, and you guys have, may have had already an experience with tongues in church or whatnot, and I'm not here to tell you, uh, was it done rightly, was it done wrong? That's not the point of this particular text. Paul's bringing up something. So the biggest, the biggest example of tongues that they already know has happened in the book of Acts. So um, if we have it up here, Acts uh, chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. I'm going to read this, um, and then we'll break this down. This is what happened um, on the day of Pentecost. So now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Check this out. If every nation under heaven was present at this place, that means, guess what? Every language was involved, okay? So everyone spoke a different language. Check this out. And at the sound, the sound, obviously the Holy Spirit, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak. And they're talking about the apostles. The apostles are preaching right now. And every single person from every nation is understanding what the apostles are saying. Everyone, they're looking at each other like, I don't even understand you, but I understand this guy over here. They hearing them speak in his own language and they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Check this out. So obviously the apostles, they're coming out. 
and they're breaking down to everyone in attendance. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything we've been reading in the Old Testament. Everything we, you guys have been studying, the man Jesus that we just crucified, he's really who he said, and he, just, and he just resurrected, and he showed himself to all of us, and you need to repent and trust in him. If not, you will never have eternal life. That's what they're saying. And everyone in attendance is, is understanding this because of the gifts of tongues. And so obviously when Paul says here, check this out, back to verse one, if I speak in the tongues of men, they're saying, listen, if I would have done the greatest thing that actually hit Christianity so far, if I would have done that, but have not love for my people, nothing. Tongues of angels as well. Every time an angel comes down in the scriptures, obviously they're talking to a human being. And we know that the angels are superior. Psalms 8 says they're a little superior. They're, a little, a little, they're, they're made a little uh, uh, better than us, obviously. So when they're speaking to us, they need a specific tongue to go ahead and talk to us. He says, hey, if I'm talking to tongues of men or angels, but have not love, man, I'm like a noisy gong. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to hear a gong solo or even a cymbal solo. I mean, maybe once, but not like, it's just, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's not pleasant. And he says, that's what you are. That's what you are when you are over there bragging and boasting about your gifts, and yet you do not have love for your brother or for your sister. At the end, remember it says, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have it up there, but at the end of um, Acts chapter 2, verse 7, it says, what good can come from Galilee? Remember in the, um, in the Gospels, they were going up to Jesus, they were like, hey, we know you're from Nazareth, we know you're from Galilee, like, like nothing, can, nothing good can come from there. So these men who were speaking in every language, they knew it was a popular and a powerful thing that was happening because Galileans, they weren't educated like that. There's no way that they knew the language of men like this. And yet they're obviously talking because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And so if you really want to get somebody's attention, you start speaking their language that you never knew. And Paul is bringing this up to them and say, hey, guys, remember what happened in, in Pentecost? Remember, that was glorious. But even if you did that and you did not have love, you miss the point. It was impressive. But he says the motivation behind you using the gift is more important than the gift itself. So for you, anybody in this room right now, if you're doing anything, if you're doing anything for the Lord and everyone has a gift, and I know some of you guys are probably thinking like, hey, well, what gift I do have? Oh, trust me, I'll get to that in a minute. But everyone has a gift that they can go ahead and give to the local church to go ahead and obviously help tell people about Jesus. And Paul is saying, if you don't have love, don't even worry about it. You're missing the point. Let's go ahead in verse two. And if I have prophetic powers, Understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Prophecy, knowledge, and faith. That's what he brings up in this verse. Prophecy, knowledge, and faith, those are all good things. Those are great things. Those are impressive things. And he's not bashing spiritual gifts because, like I said before, he's actually admonishing. He's like, hey, listen, you guys should have these gifts. And the Holy Spirit's going to give you some of these gifts. But check this out. You're missing the point. You're not loving one another. You're using your own gift for your own self-interest. And your gift is nothing. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7, we're not going to put it up there. I just want you to listen to this. He said, Paul says this, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. What's the common good? It's us right here. Like the reason you're in faith endeavor, the reason you, you, you say to yourself, okay, you know what? I'm going to join this church. I'm going to be committed to this church is because the Lord has done something in you. And you're saying, I now want to go ahead and see that in other people. They're missing out. And I join a church to obviously help me walk with Jesus. But then I use my gifts and talents, whatever it is, to go ahead and make sure that other people get to know Jesus. And like I said... Some of us in this room are probably like, man, okay, cool. Look, I can't edit videos like Frankie. I can't sing like Amanda. I can't preach like Marcio. What gift do I possibly have that can go ahead and help this church right here? And Paul is saying, love. Don't overlook the power of love. Do not underestimate that. Your time, your availability, just being there is enough. We need each other. And Paul is showing them and us 
There's a better way than just only leaning on your gifts. Robert Murray says this. He says, it's not great gifts that God blesses so much as it is great likeness to Christ. So you can have a gift. You can be very, very talented. You can be, talent, you can be the most talented person in the specific area that you are talented in. But if, if you're not striving to be like Jesus, if you are not loving people, you're not loving people who are hard to love, you missed the point. Here's the scary part. An atheist can do what I'm doing right now. He can. An atheist can come up here, open up this Bible, and give you the original meaning of the text. He can tell you exactly what was going on at the time. He can do all the studying that I did. But what he can't do is love you guys in light of how he has been loved by Jesus, because he doesn't know that. It's always said, loving to preach is one thing. You can, loving to preach is a good thing. It's one thing though. But loving to preach, loving the people that you're preaching to is something totally different. Bearing with one another. We're difficult people to deal with. I don't know if you guys understand that. I know we, I know, we know that the person next to me is difficult to deal with. But you're difficult. I'm difficult. And when we understand, like, yo, we're bearing one another. We need to, like, yeah, we're going to get on each other's nerves. We're with each other all the time now. We see each other all the time, of course, and sometimes we just don't want to be bothered. Sometimes it's, it's, it's just one of those days. And you need to go ahead and strive the, with one another because the world is watching. But they're not watching what school you graduated from. That's not what they're watching. They are watching how you love one another. That's how they know, okay, something's different about this one. Something's different about that person. And obviously the problem for them and problem for us, we don't really know what love is. Look at verse 3. Paul says, if I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. This verse right now so far, we did verse one, two, 1 and 2, but now verse 3 is kind of interesting. Because he goes to the extreme with his examples, Paul. So you're saying if I give away all that I have, there's a possibility that I didn't do that without love? That I did it without love? That, that's what you're telling me? And Paul is saying, listen, it's possible for you to be selfless outwardly while being selfish inwardly. It's possible to look like you're giving everything away. He says, listen, you gave it all away. That's crazy. Like, Paul, how are you going to tell me I don't love somebody? Look what I just gave them. Paul's saying, no, 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 because no, you did it for your own interest. You want people to notice it. You want people to go ahead and acknowledge you and, and praise you. And you want, you want this, you want that. He's saying, no, no, no. Yeah, you were, you were selfless outwardly, but you were so selfish inwardly because you still want it to be about you. That's why Jesus says in the gospel, he says, listen, whenever you do something, don't let your right hand, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. Obviously, what he's saying is like, listen, like, don't even, don't even talk, just do it. You're just doing it because you, you, there's another reason. Vertically, I've been loved by Jesus. So now horizontally, I get to love my people. And Paul is like, yo, you can give it all away. And there were people who were doing that. He's letting you know, listen, today it's possible for you to have actions that look like Christianity on the outside, but the inside is all atheism. Because the reason why you do things are so much more important than the doing itself. He says this, I, if I deliver up my body to be burned, you can, you're trying to, I can either, I can, you're, you're, all right, cool, I, I gave up my stuff, but now we're talking about giving up my life, and you're still questioning my motives, Paul? That's what we're doing here? He says, yeah, because Paul is saying that love is a better mark of spiritual maturity than being a martyr. That's crazy. Love is the ultimate mark of spiritual maturity. So best believe as Paul busts the bubble of what they thought love was, everyone's going to respond. All right, Paul. Obviously, 
All my actions aren't loving. Like, what is love then? And this is what Paul says. Verse 4 and verse 5. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Check this out. Obviously, I know in the beginning I said, listen, this is not a romantic text because it's not. However, though, your spouse, your loved one, whatever, like, like they're definitely included on this. They're going to be challenging you the most with these verses because you're with them all the time. Your kids are going to challenge you the most with this. Your parents are going like like these verses. You should be challenged every single day. And some texts in the Bible, you don't even need to expound on. Just read it and let it preach to your soul. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. My my nephew, um, uh, Josiah, um, I love him to death. And uh, one of the first times that I was um, I was hanging out with him for a whole day. There was one time that I said, "All right, Josiah, come on, we're about to go inside the the store." And um, he was just still just playing with his little dinosaurs in the car. I said, "Josiah, let's go." And I raised my voice a little bit, but it wasn't nothing crazy. I raised my voice a little bit. And he starts crying. I said, Josiah, what's the matter? He puts his hand on my face. He's like, be gentle. I was like, I was like, dang. And so I always do that with him. Every time I see him, I'm just like, be gentle. You know what I'm saying? I'm just always playing with him. But kids have a great way of letting you know, like, if you're kind or not. They have a great way of doing that. Um, and uh, so uh, he even brings up patience. Like, look at, the, look at the words he uses to go ahead and define love. Kind, patient. Like, are you long-suffering with one another? Or is it just like, hey, if you, if you wrong me once, I'm done with you. It's nothing for me to go and cut you off. It's not like, like I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll pretend like you were never there. Or are you long-suffering with one another? Do you bear with one another? Because you know whatever they just did to you is not necessarily, it doesn't define them. It was just a snapshot. Like maybe you just caught me on a bad day. Bear with me. I'm your brother. I'm your sister. Bear with me. There was one time, um, not one time, but it was a lot of times. In high school, um, I played basketball, and I used to be on the bench all the time. I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't get in the game a lot. Um, however, though, there was one game where I got in the game, though. And... Uh, they took pictures that game. I remember they took pictures that game. And so in the yearbook, somebody snapped a picture of me like going to the basketball hoop, right? So when you open the yearbook, you see me in there and it's a snapshot. It's like, and so when you look at the year, you're like, dang, Los was balling that year. It's like, now nah, you just caught me on a good day. You know what I'm saying? Like really any other day I would have been on the bench. Like that wasn't really me, what you saw in the yearbook. That's not like, I mean, I'll take it. I'll take the credit. But it's not really, that, that really didn't define my basketball season. Um, but being simple, are you quickly tempered? Do you get upset for any and every little thing? Paul is saying, listen, that's not love. There's no way that you can love that person. Um, also in this verse, um, love does not envy. Envy is a dangerous thing. Understand that. It's what caused Cain to kill his brother. It's what caused Satan to sin against God, and it's what caused us to kill Jesus. They were envious of him. Cain was envy of his brother. Satan, obviously, envy of God, and that isn't love. And, And they had this issue. They were envying one another because of the gifts, and they wanted to be better, and, 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 and they wanted to be the best. And Paul is saying, nah, that's not it. David Platt says this. He's a pastor out in Alabama. He says, you know what? You're not a mature Christian until you can root for other Christians, and it has nothing to do with you. That's it. Can you see, can you see somebody else succeeding? Can you see somebody else succeeding in a field that you wish you were succeeding in, and you still be happy for them? Man, that person... That person graduated, and, and I'm still in school. That person got the job I wanted. Man, you know what I'm saying? That person uh, got that, got this, you know what I'm saying? They're married. They're, like, 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 can you be happy for them? Paul is saying when you can do that, that's love. But if you're, if you're secretly like being envious of someone because of what they have, that's not love, and you need to check it out quick. 
it says, it does not boast. Love doesn't, why does it not boast? Because it doesn't seek its own glory. Pride, let me tell you guys something. Pride is a sneaky sin. Very sneaky. A lot of sins we can easily point out. He's like, yup, I see that. I know that one. I know lying. I know stealing. I know, I know these sins. Pride is a sneaky one. Because when you think you've killed it, that's when it's actually living. Like, you have to be careful with that one. Because when you're doing well in a certain area, oh, it's just natural for us to go ahead and seek our own glorification. But if you think about it, pride, it makes you deeply insecure. But you know what else makes you, makes you dumb? Pride is just stupid, if you think about it. Think about it. Nobody in this room will go ahead and brag about how much money they had if Oprah was sitting right next to them. Nobody in this room would brag about how fast they are if Usain Bolt was sitting right next to them. Nobody in this room would go ahead and brag about how tall they are if Yao Ming was in the room. If these people are in the room, there's no way we will brag about those specific fields. Why does God demand humility from his people? He's always in the room. And you have to remember that. That's why pride at its core is stupid. <laughs> it's just dumb when you really think about it. Jesus is always in the room. And you need to remind yourself that. So next time you get you know, you're like, man, I'm killing it right now. Oh, let me check that. It's not me. It's the Lord's work through me. Humility is so key. Verse 6, it says this, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Check this out. It, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Let me go and break this down, most practical way. Are there certain people in this world that when you hear about their failures, them doing something wrong, them getting in trouble, um, them ruining their lives in some way, does that secretly make you happy? Does it, does it put a smile on your face to, to see them like suffer a little bit? Like, man, you know what? They deserve that. Do you, do you have, is there, everyone in this room should be thinking right now, man, is there somebody that like, Yo, know, if I just found out they got a divorce today, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even care. I just, you know what? Good for her. Good for him. Or if they lost their job, or if they did this or something like that, like, like, would you secretly be happy for that? Paul is saying if you do, you don't love that person. You do not love that person. Verse 7, check this out. This is why you don't love that person. This is what Paul says. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And the key word between that verse, all. Nothing, there's nothing in this world that love cannot overcome. But what this verse does, though, is so beautiful. This specific verse kills the definition in this world that love is just a feeling. It's not. That verse is all action. That verse is a decision. You don't wake up one morning. Let me, let me just break this down for you. The person you're in love with, the person that you're married with, whatever it is, there's going to be some days that they don't look like how they used to look. Newsflash, ladies. One day you're going to get ugly. That's just what it is. Sorry to break, sorry to break it to you. Yeah, yeah, some people do. One day, one day you're going to get wrinkly. One day you're going to get, oh, like, like, that's just what's going to happen. This is why in Proverbs 31, hey, listen, true beauty is holiness. The world's beauty is only skin deep. That's it. But this beauty, it's, it, the scriptures really say, beauty is fleeting. It's passing away. But true beauty is holiness on the inside, how you carry yourself. That will never go away. But even if the skin deep beauty goes away, you choose, you choose to move on. You have chosen your love, now love your choice. That's what you have to tell yourself every single day. Even with, all right, cool, let's not even talk about marriage or anything like that. You're like, like your friends, the people that you're, you're, you're living amongst, right here, look alongside the people that you are in this room with. I have to choose to love you every day. 
because it's hard. Love is not a feeling because it's, it's not in me every day to love you. I'm not talking about put up with you. I'm talking about literally I have to love you and that is a choice. That is an action. When it says in verse 7, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. There should be nothing because there's nothing that separates the love of the Father with you. There should be nothing that can go ahead and tarnish your decision to go ahead and love your brother and sister. It takes action. You have to make that choice every day to love one another. Let's look at verses 8 through 13 as we finish this up. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. For now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. You think your gifts make you mature, but it's not. That's what Paul is telling this church. He says, that's not what makes you mature, man. That's not even what makes you a Christian. It's actually how you love one another. Why is he saying that? Because just what we just read, listen, all of that one day is going to cease. Prophecies are going to pass away. So those of you who are pro like that's going to pass away. Knowledge, everything that you've learned is going to pass away. Don't 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 harp on that. That's gone. What he says is that, listen, there's something better than all of that. He says this in verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, man. I used to act like a child. Like, brat, like little kids do that, right? Like, this is mine. I'm better than you. I'm, I'm, that's what, he's saying, like, that's what children do. And obviously in the scriptures, right, it says, hey, be like a child. But there's a difference between being childlike and being childish. He says, don't be childish. Be an adult. Be, 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 like, grow up. You're a man now. You're a woman now. Act like one. And when you're a woman, when you're a man, you can go ahead and love one another. You make that choice. He says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Wait, 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 Paul, when I look in the mirror, it's kind of clear. Why do I need it? Like when I look in the mirror, because first of all, this is 2019. Yeah, we have some good mirrors, but that's not what they used at that time. Ancient mirrors were made from polished metal. So when they used to look at themselves, it was dim. It was kind of like you saw yourself, it'll help you out, but you couldn't really get everything off. You couldn't really use it how you wanted it to. And Paul is using that analogy, right? This polished metal. He says, look, it's kind of dim when you look in it. But one day when Jesus returns, you're going to see it perfectly. You're going to see exactly what you need to see. And it's, it's what I'm talking about. It's love. And then he says at the end, check this out. Faith, hope, and love abide. But out of these three, which one's the greatest, guys? Which one, what, what's the greatest? He says love is the greatest. What? Like, faith and hope are, are really good things, Lord. If, it, if I ain't have that, we, we're not talking right now. What is faith? Faith is trust, right? When Jesus returns, he will raise us from the dead and he will, we will be with him forever. But this is what Paul is saying. Listen, one day your faith will be completed. You don't need that anymore. One day when you're face to face with Jesus, the, the, that faith is done. What about hope? Well, hope is that one day we'll be with Jesus face to face for all eternity. That's the hope that we have. And he says, listen, when you're with Jesus face to face, that hope will be completed. You won't need that either. So faith and hope, they're good things. But you know what love is? Love is eternal. Because love is a person. Love is a face. The very thing that we will be doing for all eternity is loving. The Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they love one another. 
and they love us and we will be loving them forever. That is why Paul says, out of all those three, love is the greatest because it never ends. Wouldn't it be great if we encounter more and more people out here, Faith Endeavor, right? That we, we, we continue to impact the, the city around us. We continue to impact the community around us. Or you guys are influencing the jobs and the schools that you are. You guys are bold for Jesus, right? Wouldn't it be great that the more and more people we encounter, we find out that they disagree with us. We encounter them. We encounter people who disagree with us every single day. But that they would say, you know what? I don't agree with everything those Christians believe, but I wish it was more of them around here because they know how to love. Like I may not necessarily agree with everything you're saying, but yo, I can't deny you guys love. Here's the reality. We read 1 Corinthians 13, and like I said, it's a popular verse that's used a lot. We read this. And our emotions, you know, we start loving it. We're like, man, love is patient, love is kind. I'm being reminded, yeah, I love love. And for us, it's beautiful. And it is beautiful. However, though, we read 1 Corinthians 13 and it's beautiful for us. It's warming our hearts for us. But at that time, it was not doing that for the Corinthian church. Because if you were sitting in the Corinthian church and you were hearing this letter for the first time, it was hurting you. It was the most painful rebuke you had ever heard in your life. Because as they're reading this, you remind yourself or you're reminded, that's not me. Let's bring up these, these verses one more time. Actually, if you go up a little bit um, before that. Lauren, we're going to go ahead and look at uh, some of these verses in the beginning of 1 Corinthians 13. Um, what we have here, um, and I want you to do this little exercise. So um, over here where it says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Here's a little exercise before we leave. Read that again to yourself, but as you read it, insert your name in there. And do people say that about you? Do people say that, yo, such and such is patient, such and such is kind, such and such does not envy, boast. Do people say that about you behind your back? When you're not there, can people say that about you? Would you say that about yourself, honestly? And here's the answer. No. We all fall short of that. Good. Here's what I want you to do now. Insert the name Jesus in there. Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus does not envy or boast. Jesus is not arrogant or rude. Jesus does not insist on his own way. He is not irritable or resentful. He does not rejoice at wrongdoing. And he rejoices with the truth. That's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus did for you. So where you failed, Jesus came and he lived 33 years so that he can go ahead and step in your place and be your substitute. And then when he's on the cross, he gives you his life so that these things can be said about you. And then also so that you can actually have the power to walk this out. The Bible says this, we love because he first loved us. That love, this love, this cross, it has literally, it has motivated us. Jesus on the cross, if you guys have a hard time loving your neighbor, remind yourself of the greatest act of love that has ever taken place. An innocent man laying his life down for guilty people. Remind yourself of that. For this Corinthian church, love was the missing ingredient. They had a growing church. 
They had spiritual gifts. They spoke in tongues. They demonstrated the gift of prophecy. They prided themselves on their knowledge. They even had faith, but there was no love. And because there was no love, their Christianity was empty. This led to marriages failing, relationships broken, ministries being ineffective, all because they had an incorrect concept of love. They took their eyes off Jesus. Faith Endeavor, listen to me, listen to me clear. If you are struggling to love one another, you have to remind yourself that you, you have been loved when you weren't supposed to. That while you were a sinner, this is what the scripture says, while you were a sinner, while you did everything wrong, a man by the name of Jesus steps in and he lays his life down and he loves you when there was nothing in you to love. Right now we're going to pray and I want us to remind ourselves of the gospel and as we walk out of here that we will make a choice to love one another because somebody made a choice to love us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this word and we thank you for sending your only begotten son to come, live, die, resurrect on the third day, ascend to the right hand of the Father and has promised that he will be coming back for his people. <sighs> Love is a word that we, get, we throw around so much. We say, man, I love this food or I love to travel or... I love watching football. We use that word so much, oh God, but we cannot use it in the same way when we talk about your love for us. And we should not use it in the same way when we talk about our love for one another. Will you please help us to get a clearer picture of love that as we go home, we continue to read this, we, we continue to, to, to look over the scriptures, that we continue to pray to you to, to help us understand this. And we will bear with one another, O oh God, even when we're difficult to bear with. We thank you. Nothing in our hands we bring. Simply to the cross we cling. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Amen.